Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the virtual Yorkshire Museum. My name is Lucy Crichton, and I'm the Curator of Archaeology at the Yorkshire Museum. This is the last in our series of online talks to celebrate the Yorkshire Museum's current exhibition, The Rydale Hoard, A Roman Mystery. And it's my pleasure to welcome Dr John Pierce to give this talk. Before I introduce John, I'll just go through a few logistics for the afternoon. So thank you for joining us. I'd like to welcome uh, both of you watching on Facebook and YouTube. We're streaming to both channels. I'd encourage you all to share your comments and questions in the chat of both those websites. And I will share your questions with our speaker after the talk. The talk itself will last around 40 minutes with plenty of time for discussion. So please do make yourself known. And hopefully you'll be able to see and hear us clearly throughout the talk. But don't worry if you encounter any technical issues this afternoon, as our speaker has kindly agreed to make their talk available online afterwards to watch on our YouTube channel. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Don Dr. John Pierce. John is a senior lecturer in archaeology at King's College London, and he specialises in Roman archaeology, especially of the northwestern provinces and of Italy. And he's especially interested in exploring Ro Roman funerary practice as a source for understanding society, and he's widely published on this topic and more. John is also a specialist in Roman small finds, so these portable and often highly personal objects such as dress accessories, figurines and utensils that bring us so tantalisingly close um, to people from our past. And he collaborates closely with the Portable Antiquities Scheme, advising on some of the most important Roman finds made by members of the public in England and Wales. Indeed, John was one of the first experts to research and interpret the Rydale Hoard itself shortly after it was discovered and reported to the PAS in May of 2020. And his observations on the hoard have subsequently been published with Sally Worrell in the journal Britannia in 2021. And it's the rich resource of objects recorded by the Portable Antiquities Scheme that forms the basis of John's exciting talk today, which is entitled Gods in Bronze, the Pantheon of Roman Britain and the Portable Antiquities Scheme. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to John and invite him to share his presentation. Thank you, John. Okay, thank you very much, Lucy. I hope that's visible. Yes, to that looks you great. Thank everybody. you. Right. Good. So, well, thanks to start with for the opportunity to talk. As Lucy explained, I first encountered the Rydale bronzes in 2020, and it's a nice opportunity to come back to them and reflect on how they relate to the wider context of material reported to the Portable Antiquities Scheme. Um, before I begin the, my main topic, I wanted to express a couple more words of thanks. First of all, to uh, Amy Downs and Becky Griffiths, the Yorkshire-based finds liaison officers, who um, with whom I, I worked and with um, and whose work I supported in documenting the Rydale bronzes when they when they came in. And I should also thank uh, Sally Worrell and Martin Hennig for lots of long-term collaboration on um, on objects reported to the Portable Antiquities Scheme. So as Lucy mentioned, I've collaborated with the scheme for, for quite a while, but I should stress that what I'm talking about today is very much my personal view of the objects and assemblages that I'll be that I'll be introducing. So the, the talk falls into, into three parts. First of all, a very brief reminder of what the Portable Antiquities Scheme is and a general sketch of its results. I then want to focus in particular on objects that relate to the sphere of Roman religion that have been reported to the scheme and how they inform our understanding. And then in the latter part of the talk, what I want to do is return to the Rydale bronzes and put them into that bigger picture and think about the something of their of their biography, I hope, as well as their kind of as well as their individual characteristics. So let's kick off with the Portable Antiquities Scheme, the PAS in, in general. So the Portable Antiquities Scheme has been going now for a generation, set up in 1997. One of its key strands was to document objects that were being found by members of the public, especially metal detectorists, and to create a permanent and accessible record of those objects. 
and the numbers of objects recorded by the PAS speak to its success in that respect. So more than 1.6 million objects now documented online in their publicly accessible database um, in over a million records and Roman objects predominate within that database. There are more Roman objects than those of any other period. So for example, almost 300,000 records of Roman coins now, now reported. The, the PAS database is therefore a very rich one. Quantitatively, there's a very substantial source of new data available to us. And it's just not just the numbers of objects, it's also having the georeferencing for those objects that we can put them in a spatial setting. So what I'm giving you here on the screen is one example of the kind of distribution map that one can produce. This is, so I did a search on the PAS website for figurines of Roman date. And this is the distribution map that was produced this morning, over 600 objects plotted here. The distribution map is also quite useful, not only as a quantitative reminder of how much material there is, but also that it's not an evenly distributed data set, that we tend to have uh, a lot more object records documented from Eastern England, from sort of North Yorkshire, South to Kent, and from Central and Southern England. Southwest England, Wales and Northern England have many fewer objects documented, as do urban areas too. You'll see sort of gaps in London and Manchester and, and so on. So there's a regional bias to the, to the data set. That's partly a product of the use of resources, the creation of materials in antiquity. A lot of it is also to do with the distribution of metal detecting, which focuses very much on the kind of the richer arable areas of eastern and eastern and southern England. So just more detecting happening there. It's also a reminder that what the PAS, the kinds of parts of Roman Britain that the PS tends to reach, tend to be the rural areas. The, so not the cities, not places like London or York or Winchester, but the rural areas, which I suppose historically had received less excavation than the towns and the garrisons and so on. So it's, it's a, it gives us, despite the biases in the distribution, nonetheless, one of its key foci on that rural landscape context enables us to reach the majority of the population because we estimate that probably between 90 and 95% of Romano Britons lived in the, lived in the countryside. So that's a kind of a, a, an illustration of and a reminder of the abundance of material that we have. If we zero in on Roman religion, how does the Portable Antiquities Scheme inform our understanding of Roman religion in the province? Well, I want to focus, as my title suggests, on the kinds of on the gods we see, the, the, the divine beings that were worshipped in the province and their representations. I want, before I look at some of those, I want to say a little bit about the kinds of evidence that we have. What do we mean when we're talking about objects related to religion? So I've got I've got a list of bullet points here with attributes. These are overlapping attributes. They don't map on. They don't all map onto every object, but quite a lot of objects tick several of these boxes. So we have objects that were part of instruments used in ritual. Maybe the end of a the end of a scepter, for example, or the um, or the headdress that a priest wore. Things like that. We have many objects which were made explicitly as offerings. So when someone had made a prayer to the god, asking the god to act on their behalf, they would promise them an offering in exchange. And quite a lot of the objects we're going to look at were created in that, in that context. Those objects then often became the focus of cult themselves, as they were often in the form of the cult images that would be established in temples or in household shrines and so on. Then we also have lots of objects that carry images of gods and related divine beings, not necessarily always objects that were created for a religious purpose. You know, they might be tableware that carried images of the god Bacchus or his or his um, companions and so on. So they're not always necessarily used for a religious purpose themselves. Then whether we have objects that come from shrines that may not have been created in the context of religion, but at some point in their biology were used in a sanctuary context perhaps as an offering. That's a little bit harder to see from PAS data because while we might have the object in its fine spot, we very rarely have the particular stratigraphic context from which it comes. And then we have a related category of objects that are turned into offerings because of seemingly because some particular attribute that they have 
or a process they've undergone. And I'll come back to that in particular when we look at some of the Rydale Horde objects. And then a final category that I'm not going to talk about today because it's been very nicely covered by Adam Parker in a previous lecture, which is objects relating to the sphere of magic, amulets worn on the person as protective devices and so on. They're an important part of religion, but I'm, I'm, leaving, them to, I'm leaving them to one side. So let's illustrate some of these categories with a, with a few slides, thinking first of all about objects made as part of a specific ritual. So as I've said, the form the Roman prayer will take will be a would-be worshipper um, engages the god to act on their behalf for their benefit and promises them an offering in return. And this process is reflected in a lot of Roman altars that will finish with the formula, so-and-so fulfilled their vow willingly and deservedly. And on the objects reported to the PAS, we see some of that process in action on metal objects that carry inscriptions. So we've got three examples here. We have this rather corroded bronze plaque that you can hopefully just about see that it starts off with Opt and Max up here, two of the titles of the Roman god Jupiter, and then it mentions other gods and then the, the worshipper towards the, towards the bottom. At the top right, this is a bronze spearhead that's had a dot punched inscription recording that it's dedicated to Silvanus. This is this has been offered by a man called Cunominus. We're not quite sure. Maybe he's a hunter or something like that. And then in bottom right, a gold ring carrying an inscription on the bezel. The ring might not have been initially created necessarily as a votive, but it's had incised on it the sort of the briefest possible votive inscription recording its dedication. So it says to Dei Victoriae, i.e. to the goddess Victory. So we've got these objects that are that are created or primarily used in the context of making a dedication to the god. If we move from inscribed objects to decorated objects, we'd also typically think of a Roman temple or shrine as having lots of images of the god. Quite often, as a, perhaps a major larger cult image, a statue made out of bronze or out of stone, and then smaller images that have been created as votives. For those larger temple images, their survival is really rare. Typically, any large-scale statuary made out of bronze in Roman Britain has gone into the recycling pot. We tend to be left with scraps. And you can see the kind of scrappy material that's recorded from the ear and the finger and the hand from the slide in the top, top right. A discovery that has quite a lot of parallels with the Rydale Horde, the so-called Gloucester Horde, had some rather more substantial fragments of that larger-scale statuary. So on the left, you can see a bear skin. You can just about, I hope, make out the features of the bear at the bottom down here. This looks like it's intended to resemble draped over a, be a bear skin draped over a post or something like that. This would be the kind of offering that might be made to or um, to the goddess Diana, or might be one of the spoils of the hunt that she would be carrying around with her. So you'd have a statue of her represented with her trophies. And then from the Gloucester Horde, um, the very uh, appealing and enigmatic, only complete uh, image to survive from it, a 30 centimeter long dog, a, a, despite its sort of cute appearance, it's baying as it follows the hunt. It's a follower of Diana and presumably would have been associated with a larger statue of the, of the goddess. So the PAS here and there gives us some hints at these bigger cult images that would have inhabited the interior of Roman, of Roman shrines. But most of the religious material reported through the PAS takes the form of much smaller images, images typically between maybe three or four centimeters tall and 15, 18 centimeters tall. So these are small scale miniaturized versions of those statuettes, of those, of those statues. So more than 600 of these now documented taking various forms. I've put on the screen two different forms of the god Mars, so a standing form at the top with his arms and armor, and then at the bottom, a likely version of Mars represented as a rider. In some cases, he's with his horse, in others, just surviving as the rider himself. The stats for these illuminate how far the PAS moves us on. So for example, the standing Mars, um, before the portable antiquities scheme came along, about 40 examples had previously been recorded from Britain you know, from the beginnings of archaeology in, in Britain onwards. So since 1997, 20 more figurines have been reported, so a 50% increase. 
that gives you a sense of the scaling up of the dots we can put on maps and the individual instances of these. You can see as you look as well, there's a lot of careful reproduction of the key details, both the pose and the attributes that allow us to identify this as a specific classical deity, sort of drawing on those Greek and Roman archetypes for these figures. Quite a lot of that 600 or so are not made up, however, by the, by the gods and goddesses themselves. They're made up by the attendant beings that go with them. So there are lots of small scale images of goats and sheep and chickens, for example. These are the um, attributes traditionally associated with the god Mercury. He's the herald of the gods, so the chicken or the cock will associated with him as the voice of as the voice of dawn, bringing the new day, bringing the news. And Mercury is also a god of the flock. Is also a god in charge of the flock, but looking over the well-being of the flock. So there are lots of these very similar small goat images that you can put a sample of on the screen, two or three centimeters long. What's not quite clear is what's the process of creating these associated with? Is Are these meant to be figures created to complement a standing image of the god so that he has, as it were, his cockerel and his flock with him? Or are they creations of small metal objects in lieu of animal sacrifice? So rather than killing a cockerel or a, or a goat, instead create this metal substitute for it. That might be how these come into being. And they're then placed in the temple, left as the, as the property of the god in the space that he, that he presides over. And then there, so as I've talked about objects that are created in the course of the prayer cycle, created as offerings. There's also a smaller, uh, less numerically significant, but really interesting group of material that's created as part of the regalia of the priest, the kinds of things that priests would have worn during the performance of religious rituals. Here we've got an assemblage, a metal detected assemblage, but found in a greyware pot that had been partly broken by the, by the plow. And this seems to be the kind of the clearing up of the metal contents of a shrine and storing it for some later for some later purpose. Quite what is a question that we'll come back to when we look at the Rydale Horde again. And amongst what's in here, you can see these the, 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 there are these three birds here. There's this spear-like shape. These are tops of staffs that would have been likely carried by the individuals presiding at religious ceremonies as a badge of their office, as a badge of their religious authority. And the discs that we've got the chains associated with on the right hand side, these are probably part of a piece of headgear that combines a leather cap then with metal attachments placed on the outside and dangling off it, again to mark out the role that this person is conducting within the, within the ceremony. And here, obviously taken taken off that leather that leather base collected up with other metal work to be to be deposited in the in the ground as a final kind of illustration of the types of object that we get and the kinds of context in which they're met i mentioned that there are some objects which only get an association with the sphere of the divine because of some particular use perhaps at the end of their biography so this is a group of metal vessels here found by a metal detectorist, but not excavated by the detectorist, reported, archeologists came in, here, Sally Worrell in action, archeologists excavated them. And what seems to have happened here with these um, strainers and bowls is that probably some ceremony has taken place in the countryside. And then the, the gear that's been used for that, the cooking gear, the preparation gear that's been used has been thought now to belong to the gods. So has been, so has been buried. Okay, so I've said a lot about gods. We've seen some images of them. I now want to sketch with a few slides how kind of how thoroughly the Roman pantheon seems to appear in rural Roman Britain. What a kind of substantial presence it makes. So I'm going to give. I'm going to move quite quickly through through a few slides to give you some images of the typical divinities of that Roman pantheon who we now meet. So now here we've got three bearded men: Jupiter on the left. Neptune in the middle, Mars on the right. So gods of the, the, the ruler of the god and the god of the skies, the ruler of the seas, the god of war. 
We don't have the god of the underworld, um, Pluto, here, but what we do have is one of his companion animals, the guardian to the gates of the underworld, Cerberus, with his three heads, kind of two poking rather implausibly out of the side of his chest. Bottom left, we've got the thunderbolt that a statue of Jupiter would typically have held that's been lost in our, in our image on the, on the top left. Neptune in the middle is not hopping along, as it were. What we have to imagine is that there's a rock on which he's posed his bent right leg, and in his left hand, he's holding a trident as the symbol of his rule over the, over the ocean. So here are three kind of canonical Roman male deities. Now we meet three of their female counterparts. So we've got Minerva on the left, on her arm, rather than on her chest in this case, she's got that protective device that she typically wears. So she has a gorg the head of a gorgon on her that carried about her person as a protective as a protective image. You might just about, I hope, be able to see the snaky locks of Medusa coming out here. Here's the goddess of fortune holding a horn of plenty or cornucopia in the crook of her left arm. She would have had a rudder held in her held in her right, the symbol of how fortune controls the destiny of peoples, nations, cities, whatever it might be. And on the right, we've got Venus being coy, one hand holding her hair, the other arm extended across her body as she comes naked out of the out of the bathroom. Um, a couple more statues to show you in a couple more slides to show you individual gods. So we identify these gods by their pose and by their attributes. Sometimes that's a little bit hard if um if the god survives incomplete, but where we have the full details, we can get a very concrete, confident sense of who the gods who the gods are. So this is a lovely small version of Apollo from east of York from from Hayton. This is a type that's known from wall painting and sculpture in other parts of the Roman Empire. This is Apollo playing the lyre. In his right hand, plausibly or not, he's carrying a plectrum. Then this is the lyre that he's got kind of under, the, under his left arm. What's happened here is that on a stone statue, this would be the support for the leg to make sure that the statue doesn't collapse. But it's been made a separate element here. So it almost makes it look as if Apollo is holding an upturned guitar in this case. But this is where the bronze version of the statue doesn't need that support. So it's become a detached element in its own right. So we have the lyre playing Apollo in this case. And here's another god, a very classicizing version on the left, a very provincial looking version on the right. Well, his attribute is pretty clear. This is Priapus, the god who's responsible for fertility. He's also the god who's the guardian of orchards and gardens and so on, keeps away the would-be thief from stealing the produce of the, of the allotment. For the god Bacchus, we have very few representations of the god himself, but what we have are lots of representations of his followers, the people who follow in his retinue, the sort of the party animals, as it were. So we've got on the left here, we've got a satyr, one of these young kind of part human, part goat individuals. We've got a, a, an animal skin draped across his torso. Here on this little perfume jar, you can see part of the retinue in action. So here's another half human, half goat hybrid. He's got an amphora in the crook of his arm and coming behind him is one of the, is one of the musicians advertising to the world that the retinue of, of, of Bacchus or Dionysus is passing, is passing through. Quite a lot of these images from the retinue of Bacchus appear not on, um, not as images of gods created for, um, for the purpose of votives, but as decorative motifs on objects used in everyday life. And here's another, another one of those, a very battered uh, female tiger, a tigress. She would have been a, a flashy accoutrement on a posh Roman wagon. So we've got here a reconstruction from the museum in Cologne with its figures put on the wooden framework, where we've got lots of images associated with the god Bacchus. So the god himself is riding up here. And then on the front are these two outward turned tiger images. Both have a slot in the back in order that this strut connects them to the carriage. And our image from near Deerham, our tigress from near Deerham has the very same. On the other side of the body of the tigress, you would see a long rectangular slot where she connects up. You can maybe just about see some of the added inlay on here. So these black stripes that you can see on her body. So this is niello, a silver oxide. There would also be that would have been alternating with copper inlay, so that you would have a kind of red and black 
repeated stripes against the sort of the brassy background of the of the tigress herself. Ocean, the kind of the god of the personification of the of the sea, has a connection with Bacchus because he yields up the bounty of the sea to to provide to the feast. So we've got a very nice new discovery of a mask of Oceanus from just outside Basingstoke, made at about the same time as the Rydale Horde here, with Ocean with his kind of layers of overlapping sea vegetation, the sea creatures gambling through his hair and so on. And then one of my one of my own favorites from the Portable Antiquities scheme, a really rare find for the Roman Empire, a single freestanding image of Capricorn, which is Capricorn we're familiar with as a part of the one of the signs of the zodiac. Um, and it's not quite clear whether this was originally part of an ensemble of zodiacal creatures or because Capricorn is also used as a military standard, whether this comes from some kind of military military shrine. It's found with nothing else. It's fine spot at Burrington in in Somerset, so its context is not is not clear. So I've talked us through all these Roman gods and goddesses that we seem to find. The, the cumulative effect of them is, as I've said, it's to make us realise how familiar the rural population was with the range of the Roman pantheon. The Roman pantheon, in all its diversity, of which I've only given a taster here. It's also interesting to see the many different variants of, e of the representation of each god that you, that you get. So clearly there's a widespread familiarity, not only with these as divine beings, but also with their varied iconographic types, lots of different models being used to create these images of gods. However, there is a major caveat. For most of these 600 plus images, we only have the, the, the statuette surviving, for example. The base that goes with it is usually lost. That might sometimes have carried an inscription. And where the inscription does survive, that makes us hesitate a lot about identifying these gods. This is another group found through metal detecting with a follow-up excavation. It's from Ashwell in Hertfordshire. The group initially found by the metal detectorist mostly comprised a series of very thin precious metal plaques or leaves that carried the image, an image of the god on them and an inscription below, the inscription detailing who'd made this as an, who had offered this to the god and who the god was who was the recipient. The image is recurringly show the god kind of standing in a temple. So here we've got the image of the god and the imagery in general in this particular case, commonly on the Roman goddess Minerva. So showing all the usual attributes of Minerva. Had only the image survived, we would have happily called it Minerva as we would a figurine like the one at our bottom right, which is clearly Minerva as well. However, the inscription tells a different story. In this case, the inscription is to the goddess Senuna, a goddess who's not known outside Britain and is mainly known only from the spring sanctuary um, in North Hertfordshire. So clearly what is the etymology of Senuna means it means something like the old one or the old lady is the is the root of the identity of this of this divinity. So clearly what's happened with the worshippers of Senuna, there's not an existing iconographic tradition for Senuna. There isn't, as it were, a standard for how to represent her. So her pious worshippers wanting to make this kind of offering, which requires an image, have remodeled her in the form of Minerva, have drawn on a classical prototype in order to represent what they think is the kind of the, the attributes, the skills, the areas of expertise of this god. So it does make us hesitate and wonder if behind a lot of our images, which seem to be like those of Roman gods or goddesses, whether there's some local indigenous understanding and that a very different name would be applied to them if we had a um, surviving inscription. Okay, so that's some wider context. I now want to bring us back to the Rydale Horde to see how that fits within the, within the picture of the evidence of religion that we've got from the, from the province. So what I want to do now is to kind of is to go over the four individual components of the horde. So we've got the male head, we've got the rider on horseback, we have the likely key handle in the form of a horse, and then we have the, the plumb bob. And I'm going to start with probably the most striking, striking image of all of them. And that's the bust of this bearded male figure. So mainly showing the main detail that survives is his head, 
and then on the bust element we've got these holes for attaching him to, to something else. We'll come back functionally to what this is shortly. The first thing I want to look at is who is this? Where do we put this representation amongst those divinities I've talked about or is some other identification appropriate? So there are echoes here of the god Jupiter. Jupiter is shown as a typically as a mature man, a bearded male figure, a very full head of hair, a very long flowing beard and so on. I've got a couple of representations of Jupiter for, to the left and right framing um, our, Rydale, our Rydale figure. It's possible that this is intended to represent Jupiter, but I think probably it's the, it's the a less likely option. The beard and hair are not quite as full and flowing, perhaps, as one might anticipate from the representations of the god. And also the hairline of our Rydale figure is much closer to the, to the eyebrows than it is on the, on the representations of Jupiter, where the hair tends to rise in a kind of peak towards the top of the head and then cascade down either side in these, in these flowing curls. So Jupiter possible, but I, I think less, less likely. I think the more plausible identification of our figure lies with one of the second century, the mid second century, mid to late second century emperors. So there's a change in imperial fashions in the second century AD. After the clean shaven Julio Claudians and their immediately successors, the emperor Hadrian switched his to a bearded portrait type. And that's followed by his, by his successors, but both beards and hair get fuller. So probably the main candidates in the frame with which we might identify our Rydale figure are pictured here. I've put them in chronological order from Antoninus Pius, top left, Lucius Verus and Marcus Aurelius, respectively top right and bottom left, and then taking us to the end of the second century AD, the Emperor, the Emperor Commodus. Out of these, Probably the closest resemblance lies with Marcus Aurelius, the figure who's at the who's at the bottom, who's at the bottom left. So, for example, in terms of Commodus, we might rule out because the hair sits rather high up on the forehead, so seems seems less likely. Antoninus Pius, probably the beard and hair are not quite exuberant enough; they're sort of still keeping a little bit more to the more restrained Trajanic model. And Lucius Verus, maybe the hair and beard are a little bit too luxuriant to be plausible candidates. So we fall back on Marcus Aurelius, bottom left, as the most likely uh, individual whose portrait type is being replicated in, the, in this bust from, from Rydale. Obviously, it's hard to make direct comparisons because we're dealing with differences in scale. These are life-size or larger stone images. We're dealing with differences in material, bronze versus bronze versus marble. And also we're dealing with very different artistic traditions. So we've got the highly naturalizing and idealizing um, classicism that we can see in the Roman imperial portraits versus the very heavy stylization that's going on in, in our Rydale image. And that stylization is, we well, can see it in lots of things, but above all, I think in the, in the twisting of the hair and especially the beard where it bifurcates on the chin into these kind of corkscrew locks. We'd also see it in the relationship between the size of the eyes and the rest of the face. Pretty naturalistic in our marble images, but with the eyes having this much larger, rather sort of mesmeric feel to them on the, on the Rydale bust. What makes it hard to appreciate the original impact of the Rydale bust is, of course, the loss of whatever inlay went into the eye sockets. That would likely have had a color contrast with the sort of the gold of the original of the original bronze, and it's hard to it's hard to sort of revive that effect. We've got one comparandum from Britain which helps us. So most plausibly, then, this is a representation in a very local style of a Roman emperor, the Emperor Marcus Aurelius being the most likely candidate, but maybe not quite possible to exclude others. This is very helpful from a more basic archaeological point of view because it gives us a likely date for at least one element of the assemblage. And it's probably the, the only element of the assemblage that we can date more closely than to the general Roman period, if one's going to be cautious about this. So what kind of, where do we classify then the presence of an emperor? So the emperor is obviously a political figure, a ruling human authority. But within the Roman period, there's a very strong affinity 
between the emperors and other members of the imperial house and the divine. So emperors, of course, claim that they're descended from gods, that their immediate parents, their immediate forebears are deified. And typically dedications to Roman gods from Britain and beyond often include a reference to the emperor after a god has been offered something. In this case, this is an arch constructed for a temple just outside Roman Lincoln. It's the Mars, but it's a twin dedication with the noumena of the emperors. So the, the possession of a noumen, a kind of divine spirit, is something that distinguishes the emperor from other beings. So emperors have this close affinity to divinities while they're living. And then once they're dead, they become in a less complicated way, the equivalent of the likes of Mars, Jupiter, Juno, Minerva, and so on, because they have undergone deification. So we can put our Marcus Aurelius in inverted commas from Rydale very much in that category of divine beings, beings who are likely to command worship. Okay, what is this thing functionally? Well, happily, there are a range of parallels from Britain that allow us to say a little bit more about the purpose of the of the Rydale bust. And I've taken several of them for this for this slide. The Rydale example is by far the most northerly of the surviving instances of the conversion of imperial images into the into these relatively small um, metal heads or busts. So I've put them in approximate, they are arranged according to scale approximately, starting with a bust of Commodus, likely almost 20 centimeters high on the left, down to the much smaller image of Antoninus Pius on the right, um, not, quite, not quite 10 centimeters. So you can see the affinity between the Rydale image and these other images, and that there are differences in terms of style of hair, style of beards, and so on, that allow us to relate these instances more or less plausibly to individual second century emperors. So it's quite likely that both the, the Brackley or Steen head here, another portable antiquity scheme find, and the Rydale find both represent Marcus Aurelius. And it's the Brackley head that gives us a sense of how the, the image is converted to a much more powerful presence when the eyes survive. So here we've got these cobalt blue discs surviving on the Brackley head of Marcus Aurelius to give us a sense of that kind of, that commanding imperial, imperial presence. Like the Rydale head, all of these images are hollow and all of them are socketed at the base. So if we turn a couple of them round, so we've got Commodus on the left and we've got um, Antoninus Pius on the right, all of them are socketed. They have holes and quite a few of them have attachment holes that would have connected them to a staff or pole, um, either of wood or metal, that would have allowed these to be carried. Interestingly, the Rydale head is unlike the other ones. The heads are fully modeled in the rounds. So you can see the back of Commodus's helmet on the left. You can see Antoninus's, um, Antoninus Pius's hair, the back of his head on the right. But for the Rydale head, the top of the, the, top of the bust is smooth. And then the, the back of the bust is open and it's got a separate back plate, a very thin and bronze back plate attached to it. But at the bottom, you can see the point where the socket goes, goes in to put the head on the end of a staff and turn it into a, into a scepter. To get a sense of the form of these scepters, we don't have to go quite as far as southern England. We can go to Brough on Humber to a burial excavated before World War II. Well, sort of the remnants of it gathered up actually rather than formally excavated by Philip Corder and Ian Richmond. This is where we had, this is a, a burial made with two scepters in it. So the most striking finds are these metal terminals to put on the end of a pole, in this case of the god Mars rather than of an emperor. But what was also recovered from the Bruff on Humber burials was burial, was the, the butt or the other end of the scepter where it could potentially be rested. Also the collar elements that held the lengths of the scepter together. And in this case, the metal stem. So this was a scepter that had, as it was made of an iron rod which would have been a kind of silvery color originally. And then it had a bronze butt, bronze collars, and a bronze terminal in the form of the god, god Mars. Corder and Richmond thought originally the better preserved example, Scepter, Scepter One, was probably about three feet long. Alessandra Esposito, in a recent monograph on these items of regalia, thinks that's an overestimate. She guesses more likely 60, 60 centimeters. 
So that's what we have here then. So we've got the emperor's heads on the end of a scepter that is presumably carried by a priest as a badge of their office is borne along in processions in town or in country. It's what they'll be holding when someone else is sacrificing an animal on their behalf with them presiding over it. So at the ceremony, you know who takes the leading role because of their possession of the, of the scepter. Okay, if we move on to our second element from the Rydale Horde, the horse and rider figurine. This is a small figure, only not quite eight centimeters, eight centimeters long. It's got, um, the rider is quite complete. He's missing the spear that he would have held in his right hand, and he's missing the shield that he would have held in his left. Also, some of the crest on the top of his helmet has been lost. So we can sort of reconstruct the detail plausibly on the basis of other related figures, but this is a rather battered one. Then he's wearing this pleated tunic that kind of rides quite high up on his thigh, not quite clear whether he's um, bare-legged or trousered below. And then for his steed, we've got not so much you know, modeling of anatomical detail, but lots of emphasis on the harness. So on the bridle and on the breastband and on the girth and so on, you can just about see maybe the saddle that he's in. And then these round discs, these are the strap junctions, the, thing that, the things that connect the different lengths of leather together. So this is, as it were, a very well presented horse with its leather and metal um, attachments that make the harness this kind of functional but impressive element. So we've got the riding armed god moving along here as his horse puts its um, front right leg forward. Like our scepter with the, that we've just been talking about, this is also a type that we can recognize because it's documented in other examples of figurines and also in other, in other media. So I've given you one main instance on here, probably the finest surviving one from Britain, finest in terms of surviving detail. So the care that's lavished on the representation of the horse's mane. Again, you can see a different way of representing the harness of the horse here. Lots of detail of the tunic and on the cloak of the rider and then his helmet too. Um, he too has lost his spear and shield. You know, the extremities are typically broken off. And then you can see that there are other variants here. So not everybody is represented as dressed. There are some riders who are seemingly naked. This rider, this prong is to attach him to the horse. The stub on the chest probably holds, supports the shield here. You can see they've got different headgear, headgear and so on. So there are different ways in which this rider is rendered. There's also a parallel tradition of creating brooches in the form of the same rider god, but even more heavily schematized. So here's the rider up here with this kind of long crest for his helmet. There's the body of the horse. And rather than trying representing any kind of detail, instead, the body of the horse and rider is divided up into these enameled cells that typically have a range of blue and yellow and green and red enamel. These are widely dis the distribution map for these brooches. So these would be could be pinned to cloaks, but could also be made as made as offerings. There's one very likely temple site for this rider god near Leicester, near the, near the Bosworth Field Battle site that has a very large collection of these. So they could be worn on the body as a protective device, but could also be deposited as gifts to the god. The distribution map that you see of the rider brooches is pretty similar to the distribution map of the same metal figurines. So we've got this charging god. Who's he charging at? Again, some related images maybe help us. So from Lincolnshire, we've got our one representation of the rider god in stone. And we've also got here the foe who he's trampling beneath his feet. This is a um, d another divine being. You can see maybe a snake-like body ending in this tail. And then there's a big bearded head. It's partly been lost, difficult to work out who it is. But from other Roman art, we can identify this very clearly. This is a giant. So with a very muscular male torso and then the legs turning into turning into snaky extremities. So the gods and the giants in Greek mythology are bitter foes. The gods ultimately overcome the giants. The giants are a sort of symbol of chaos and disorder and barbarism and so on. So the fact that the gods defeat them is a sort of is a reassurance to to humans that the world works as it as it should. So we might imagine that maybe our horse and rider could sometimes be ranged up against a giant foe. And here's our single representation of a giant in bronze from Britain, from, um, from Lincolnshire, from Caneby Corner, with the giant who's being either shot at or ridden down by a, by a foe. 
Another possibility is that the rider is charging against a human enemy rather than an immortal, rather than a rather than a divine one. So there's a base, there's a statue base from um, from Suffolk that you can see here. All that survives of the rider is the stub where the horse joined onto the onto the base plate. It's got the inscription around the edge unusually, so we know it's dedicated to dedicated to Mars. And then we've got this prostrate figure, supine on the ground, arms and legs raised slightly, but is being in, in the process of being ridden down. And this image, the triumphant rider, is one that comes out of Roman state art, of the emperor charging into the rescue, riding over a barbarian foe, like we've got in this image from the Arch of Constantine here that shows the that shows the um the Emperor Trajan. So this is another possibility for when individuals were choosing a horse and rider god, who they imagined this horse and rider to be defending against. But this statue base from Colchester is important because it identifies for us that this is a version of the god Mars. Which Mars, though? Is this perhaps a local Mars? And this is where we can return to our inscription. So within part of our distribution, the horse and rider distribution of statues and statuettes is quite wide from sort of from North Yorkshire down through Eastern England and into central Southern England. But clustering in Lincolnshire and a little bit in Leicestershire and Nottinghamshire are a group of silver rings that are inscribed with the letters T-O-T and occasionally a little bit more expansive that say Deo T-O-T-A. Who is Tot or Tota? Another inscription from Britain helps expand that abbreviation. An inscription from a little further further south, from Barkway in Hertfordshire, that says to Mars Tutatis. So maybe what we have here then is one local identification of this riding Mars. If we think the rider version of Mars, it's an image type that's quite widely shared across Roman Britain. But maybe, depending on where you are in Britain, that god will be given a different name. And the name Tutatis is quite an evocative one. Tutatis etymo etymologically means Mars of the tribe or of the people or of the community. So we tend to think of Mars as the kind of bellicose, warlike deity. But Mars's function is just as much protective of the community as it is specifically a martial one. He's also the guardian of crops and he's the guardian of fields, which I think might be important in the Rydale connection. So he's a guardian of the community and of their agricultural well well-being. Okay, let's move to our final two objects in the in the Rydale horde, where we move away now from objects that were specifically made for religious purposes. We're moving now to two practical objects. The first of these is a is a plumb bob. So a plumb bob could be used by a by a mason as a plumb a plumb line. And quite often it's used as a, a sort of badge of office on the funerary memorials for Roman stone workers. So we have an example from Northern Italy here where you can see a collection of Mason's tools and then the plumb line kind of dividing this base for this stele in the middle. So the, the plumb bob here suspended on its line could be used singly by a Mason, but there's also a Roman surveyor's instrument called a groma which uses four of these plumb lines in order to lay out straight lines and to lay lines out at right angles. So for example, when you're building a road or when you're laying out an urban grid and you need a rectilinear street plan, or maybe when you've conquered a landscape and you're dividing it up, having expropriated it, giving it out to new settlers, you divide it up into squares or rectangles, as it were. You lay out those divisions through ditches or fences or hedges. And the groma is the kind of tool that you might use to help you survey out those new landscape dividing elements. So I want you. So why then do we have this kind of object with two religious objects? Well, we could. What one sometimes sees in Roman temples is where people have deposited objects that relate to their professional activity. That might be where, for example, they're moving from one state to another. So Roman soldiers, perhaps as a post-retirement rite of passage, deposit items of military equivalent, equipment to mark the fact that they've moved beyond that army status. Or it might be that having completed a particularly significant job, a major task of construction, you promised the god that you would make an offering at the end of it, and that offering relates to the process that the god looked over and went happily. 
so you offer them an appropriate object you know on a pars pro toto basis part part for whole that symbolized that process that had gone gone well it's one possibility and then how about our final object our, our key handle from Rydale. Well, key handle is the most plausible identification for this. You can just about, so this is looking at the back of the handle. It takes the form of a horse protome or the four limbs and head, head of a horse. There's clearly a collar element has been lost that in which an iron shank sat. You can see the square remains of the iron shank. And then if this is a key, the bit of the key, the bit that kind of connects with the lock tumbler has been completely lost. Fancy keys of this kind are known. We've got an example from France here with a different kind of horse um, handle terminal. But in this case, the shank and the bit survive to give you an illustration of what this might have looked like, looked like once. These fancy key handles are also known from other portable antiquities scheme examples. Here's a nice one that combines three heads, an old man, a young man, and then a head of a wild boar if seen and, and on. So what is this? doing in the Rydale in the Rydale horde. So this is a little bit harder to harder to explain, but one possibility, remembering that quite a lot of our religious objects take the form of animals, which I suggested might be a small metal offering created in in exchange for or instead of a live animal subject. Might that be the case with our horse here, that rather than offering a horse sacrifice, instead here's an image of the horse given to the god. The difficulty with that is that not many Roman deities accept horses as their typical sacrificial animal, but one who does is Mars on a very specific occasion in the year, known in the Roman festival calendar, the so-called October horse, to mark the end of the military campaigning season. That is a ritual, though, that's only known from Rome. So whether it can apply here in this, you know, the northern end of this remote province, difficult to, difficult to say. So if we put all these observations on these individual objects together, what can we come up with? How, if we're thinking about the biography of, it, of this hoard, how did it come into being? Well, maybe it was only at the very end of their use life that they all came together, that they were collected as a group of scrap pieces of metal that could be potentially melted down and reused for some, for some new purpose, that they're a metal resource. And that's not, that's not impossible. However, I think there are reasons for thinking about them in a different way, that in different senses, either through deliberate creation or expedient use, they all had a role in votive, either because they were used in religious practice or at a certain point they were thought of as appropriate offerings. And I've talked about scenarios where we could come up with an offering of a Mars figurine, of a plumb bob and of this, and of this horse. So we could just see these as the accumulating acts of separate dedication. Or actually, is there any way of thinking that they might all have been deposited once together? So here's a kind of very speculative scenario for you. So our date, taking our Marcus Aurelius head, is late second, late second century AD. Those heads from southern Britain that are found that are that are similar, those scepter terminals, Antoninus Pius and so on, some of these are from the Fen Edge. And what happens at that period along the Fen Edge is that there are major aspects there are major programs of land drainage and land reallocation for farming and to new and to new owners and one of the interpretations then of these imperial presences on the fen edge is that this marks the allocation of land perhaps for an imperial estate or under imperial authority so might this be that someone kind of carrying regalia that recall the emperor acting on behalf of the emperor, is un has undertaken an act of landscape reorganization in this area. They've brought in Mars because Mars is a guardian of the community, but he's also the guardian of the crops and of agricultural fertility and so on. So for a landscape that's been newly organized, perhaps if we've got drainage of wetlands or clearance of slopes, fencing in of new pasture or new arable land, perhaps that helps bring that in. How would you have done that? You'd have needed a surveyor to put that in place. So maybe that's where the plumb bob comes from, someone using their someone using their groma. What would be appropriate animals to sacrifice? Perhaps that's where our, our horse as a complement or substitute for that sacrificial process comes in. You know, this is highly speculative, 
but it's you know it's one scenario that helps us think about how these objects might interlock so that's how they came into being perhaps how they were dedicated in an act that was either saw placing in a temple or some sort of landscape offering what about their deposition then why were they all put together was this as i've suggested the safekeeping of a resource that might be is this perhaps a final act of reverence that the temple is going out of commission or there is no more space for new offerings so sensitive to the enduring kind of numinous quality of these objects you bury them reverently in the ground together or as perhaps christian converts you have a fear of the potential power of these objects and want to put them out of sight and out of and out of mind and this is where some of our other finds recorded to, reported to the PAS come in and help us understand that process. So the Gloucester Horde, of which we've seen the dog already, clearly this is an action where different um, the different metal contents of a shrine somewhere near Gloucester are brought together. Some they're generally broken up. The bronze is separated from the wood or from the stone. They're, they're bundled up. They're placed in layers in the pit. There are lots of box and casket fittings here that might be from the from the money chest and so on. The statue fragments are almost at the bottom. The dog is placed at the bottom. And then a scepter, the butt from it, so a symbol of that religious authority, is placed at the top to close off the deposit. Might there be something similar in our in our Rydale? Rydale hoard. So at that point, with that suggestion about what happened as the final act of the biography, I'm going to stop. So thank you for listening. And I've put here, if anyone wants to follow up some of the references I've made or the objects that I've um that I've talked about, then they're then they're here on the on the slide. Thank you. Thank you, John, for an excellent lecture and very richly illustrated, a fantastic I suppose a fantastic advert for the success of the portable antiquities scheme and a reminder of just the amazing Roman material culture that we're very lucky to have in this country. Um, I would invite our audience to please get your comments and questions in. Now is the time. Um, but as chair, I get the privilege of, of asking the question first. And I think you've touched upon a couple of aspects of the Rydale Horde that particularly intrigue me and it's the mix of kind of imperial subjects in a provincial way through the presentation of the po possible probable Marcus Aurelius and also the, the possible local version of Mars and of course we have to caveat this with with possibles and maybes. Um, the most enigmatic object in the Horde is is the scepter head itself and I wondered if there were other provincial depictions of emperors in other media and in other forms or if it seems to be um, a distinct phenomena in these scepter heads that we see and as a follow-on question also related to the scepter heads the examples that you showed were primarily um, Antonine emperors. And I mm. wondered if this is a particular tradition um, present in the second century, or if, if there are other scepter heads from earlier or later emperors and, and how they might differ in style. So thank you in advance. Okay, so taking the, the first question first, is, it, is this a very specific provincial form of representing uh, an imperial portrait? Uh, the short answer is no. So for, for an equivalent, you might go to um, to the opposite end of the empire. So head, head southeast and you see a recurring Roman imperial presence in stone reliefs in Egypt where Roman emperors are turned into pharaohs. But the inscriptions underneath make it very clear, unlike our case where we don't have the inscription. In that case, the inscriptions underneath make it very clear the identity of these figures who you wouldn't otherwise have stopped to look at as Roman emperors you would have assumed it was just a very traditional Egyptian authority image. So that's a, that's that's an alternative version of that conversion of an emperor into something that that is that draws on local artistic traditions. In terms of the the date of the um, the scepter heads, so curiously they the the ones that can be the, the scepter heads fall into a range of types. So I talked about ones that have Mars terminals 
and obviously the ones that have imperial images or probable imperial images on them. Probably the more common ones, as the PAS is teaching us, are very small bird images. So there's, there, is a, there is a variety, but it falls into a, a, a few common types. But amongst the emperors, they are all Antonine. Um, the one is, well, there's one I didn't show that's claimed as a second century, as a Hadrianic possibility, but that's, that's an even more stylized version. There's a, there is a group that got away. So there was a notorious case from the 1980s of the Icklingham bronzes, which is a group of terminals which were illegally found and taken out of the taken out of Britain to the to the US and they're not very well documented but the the photos I've seen they're all also bearded figures though I'm not sure they can be quite so convincingly related to type but they are all they are all in that range so you know one is identified as Antoninus Pius from William Fenn we've got Commodus um, fr from another Cambridgeshire site uh, we've got Lucius Lucius Verus. So the main argument that's been based on that so far is that because that's a major period of landscape reorganization and you know from that fen edge into the into the fens it you know it used to be very confidently argued that this is it's a huge imperial estate and these are markers of the the ownership of the of that estate but people aren't so confident about that explanation for the fen land changes now and it's seen more as this kind of piecemeal process but it's it is a curious thing that with this particular manifestation and that the other curiosity is that they are there's this group of them and then Rydale is really an outlier from that you know the, the it's a long way north from all the from all the rest there are other scepters and like the Bruff on humble ones but they're not in imperial in imperial form so one wonders why he's so far from his you know adoptive father and adopt and and son um in you know north of york thank you very much john that's that's fascinating and yes the the inclusion of the scepter head such a special object is just one of the the, the many ways in which the rydell horde is well quite unique i think uh, but especially unique when you consider just how north it is as you say the majority of these other examples that you've shown kind of clustering around southeastern England, thank you so much. The questions are rolling in, so I better um, I better read some of them out and stop hogging the discussion as I usually do. And um, we've got a question from Malcolm who says, "Thank you for an excellent lecture." He asks if any of the god images that you've um, discussed have been connected to the sixth or ninth legions, and I might. Um, I suppose, broaden this question a little bit and ask whether any of them can be associated with the wider Roman army in Britain. Mm. And just for the benefit of um, perhaps some less local audiences, the 6th and the ninth Legion of the Roman army are the legions that are linked to York and made um, the Roman um, settlement of York their home. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. I mean, one difficulty with the PAS material is that you'll have seen in the absences on the map, there are you know the main military areas. So there's very little evidence from Wales and also very little evidence from Hadrian's Wall. And that's for a couple of reasons. That's partly because it's illegal to detect on scheduled ancient monuments. And a lot of those major, major military sites are scheduled. Um, other military sites also, you know, like York and Chester and so on lie in urban areas. So I mean, metal detecting is not a, not a, um, a feasible uh, activity there is the one out of the things that i've looked at one of them i'm intrigued by i talked about briefly that capricorn image from somerset so capricorn is uh, a well, obviously it's a zodiac sign but it's closely associated with the emperor augustus because though he's born in september he claims it as his birth sign because he seemingly on the advice of his astrologers he adopts it as a particularly auspicious symbol. And there's, there's there's a lot written about why he might choose that. But following Augustus's adoption of Capricorn as his birth symbol, then it becomes a sort of a, a, a symbol that some military units adopt. Um, and so the Second Legion Augusta, based in Caerleon, as has the Capricorn as one of its as one of its symbols. So though at, at Burrington we're on the other side. I have wondered if of the of the of the um, Bristol Channel, I've wondered if the Barrington figurine might come from a military shrine. 
It's also it's very close to the lead works on the Mendip Hills, which are under military control. So that's you know, that's that's one that's one possibility. Burrington is also not very far from Bath, and Bath is the kind of person, kind of place, where you'd expect astrologers to be hanging out. You know, if you wanted to consult an astrologer. So there are other possibilities for explaining that one. The sixth and the ninth. Okay, here I'm going to draw on Lucy for help. So the sixth legion, that's the boar, isn't it? As one of the as one of the emblems, and the difficulty with that is that both of claiming any specific association is that boar images are one of the few figurine types that gets going in the late Iron Age. So they represent a kind of they, you know that anticipates the explosion of image making in the Roman in the Roman period, and those boar images are pretty widely found. So I'd be hesitant about claiming that as an association. And the ninth legion, I'm going to, kind of, I'm going to pass on because I can't, I can't remember what we know about the standard, if anything, about the standard of the ninth legion. Well, I think the most obvious way that I can link the horde to a potential military presence, whether it be the sixth or the ninth legion or an auxiliary soldier, is perhaps just the the presence of Mars. Um, who, as you have discussed, has these slightly lesser known associations mm. with protection and agriculture, but for most people is is the god of war. Um, I suppose on a very simple basis, could the presence of Mars suggest that either a legionary or an auxiliary soldier had something to do with some of these objects? Or does the proliferation of material culture associated with Mars suggest that that just can't be um, can't be stated? I think it's the latter because those, you know, those horse and rider figurines, you know, again, we're up at the top end of the, the most northerly end of their of their distribution. And they are, you know, we've got a lot of figurines from Hadrian's Wall from excavations, and they're not a type that I'm not going to say they're never there because probably someone will could, contradict me almost immediately but they're very rare if at all present but they are found across that sort of sweep of England east of the Pennines down into East Anglia and into Oxfordshire and Hampshire and so on and the horse and rider brooches you know those little enameled plate brooches their distribution is quite similar so it's really not a military association and there are you know there's enough dedications to Mars I showed that one example from Lincoln to Mars you know king of the grove Rigo Nematos, but there are, you know, there's Mars Tutatis, if that's right, for top rings, and they're not really militarily associated. So it'd be nice when one wants these things to kind of hang on to, to try and put the context. I think if you wanted to link to the Roman army, then if you think that the my suggestion about the Groma use has has any viability to it, then the kinds of people who do that surveying, you know, Roman soldiers are regularly doing that kind of landscape Absolutely. survey so you know if you wanted to draw the art i'd say if you wanted to make a military explanation for it that might be a that might put you on a slightly stronger footing but of course it doesn't have to be a groma if it's a you know if it's a groma why not all four of them rather than rather than one Brilliant. Thank you, John. We've got um, several other questions. So if you're happy for me to ask a couple sure. more, yeah. we have a question from David who says, thank you, John. He points out that many of the figurines that you've um, used in your talk are, are made of copper alloy. And is there any indication that particular materials were associated with images of certain gods? Mm, I, I don't think so. Um, I think it, uh, you know, the, the vast majority of the PAS finds, but also of other, you know, the non-PAS similar figurines and so on from Roman Britain. Copper alloy predominates. When you get, you do get gold and silver images. I mean, the best example I showed was the Ashwell, was the Ashwell hoard, where you have those really thin leaves made of silver and gold that have the stamped images mm. of the deity and then punched dedications recording who's, who's done it. And that's, and those are for Sununa, who's a kind of a local spring deity, you know, doesn't necessarily occupy a very illustrious position in the overall hierarchy. So I think the answer to that is probably that it depends very much on the action of an individual patron, the resources that they have available. You know, one does find, you know, gold and silver imperial images. They're, they're vanishingly, they're vanishingly rare. There's a nice one from Avanche in Switzerland of it's either Marcus Aurelius or Septimius Severus. It's another bearded imperial head. 
but they are very few and far far between is it you know maybe emperors are slightly more likely to get that kind of dedication i don't know mm -hmm. you know when it's a statue rather than i mean those those leaves are very thin so the amount of precious metal that's used is probably considerably less than than for a you know a, a larger a larger statue mm. but so I perhaps think... more availability of resources mm. for the individual rather than anything more symbolic in terms yeah, of material I, I think so and also it's mm. hard to judge you know what's the is there a differential effect of recycling to you know on precious metal versus versus copper alloy as well you know have more of those just been melted down uh, because of that absolutely you know, we're always doing a, potential. a sample of a sample aren't we <laughs> yes. with these things yeah. it's very difficult to make um sweeping statements and we have a question from danny who has proposed a very interesting um possible interpretation of the the emperor in the rydale horde and he says from the images could it be possible that the local population considered the antonine emperors as gods of war considering the vast movement and occupation of land that was happening in this period and this question interested me because it, it reminds us that not everybody in the in the roman empire would see symbols in the same way mm. um yeah what what do you think of that john yes that's um it's difficult to you know one could come up with reasons why individual emperors amongst that series of emperors who go on scepter heads could be considered in that way. So thinking maybe about Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus together, another interesting PAS find shows us how people are sensitive to their martial reputation. So this is a Mendip Hills find and it's a lead pig. It's the latest dated lead pig that survives, you know, that has got those imperial names stamped in it. And it's it says that this lead pig is the property of the joint emperors, Marcus and Lucius Verus. And then it gives their, the title that they've won when they're militarily successful in Armenia. So it calls them the Armeniaki. So it shows that, you know, in the 8160s in Somerset, in the mining area, people are very sensitive to that martial reputation. And probably it's important to put that to show that, you know, you're a loyal and reverent subject of the emperor. Obviously, in the um, the Rydale Horde, we're not so far from mining areas, you know, moving across the moving across the Vale of York. We're not so far from York. You know, those are all places where that news of imperial success would be would be trumpeted. So one could see how you might read into seeing the scepter. It's a reminder, ah yes, here we've got our glorious Emperor Marcus, or in Britain, Antoninus Pius, you know, pushing the frontiers further north. However, the disadvantage is, is that other, other Roman emperors have military reputations that are as great, if not greater. So where are they then, you know, the likes of Trajan or Vespasian and so on? Why in this particular period? So I could see how a sense of their martial reputation could be read into the image. And that might also add to the fact that these emperors are beings of you know with special authority given their affinities to the gods and they're demonstrating that special authority through their you know their all conquering prowess but whether that's the so individuals might see them like that but whether that's the reason that they're commissioned is is hard to say absolutely and whether the um the associations with that object and the way that people saw that object change during the object's mm. lifetime as yeah. well is always a possibility absolutely fascinating thank you john i'm going to ask you one more question right, and then okay. we can draw our discussion right. to a close um so we have a question from alex alessandra right. and she um they ask could it be possible that the horde represents objects in the ownership of a college or collegium with an imperial connection and presumably that comes um that suggestion mostly comes from the inclusion of the scepter head Yes, that's um. I guess it's we're a long way from a town here. You Absolutely. know, the, the places where you would expect collegia to be operating would be somewhere like York, especially, and maybe at a pinch Aldborough, where you might have people gathering together because they were trading in the same kind of commodity, or they were makers of the same thing, or they were the they were had a particular affinity with a particular god but they tend to be an urban they tend to be urban phenomena and those scepters are you know whatever their they you know their distribution is quite wide but they are mainly a rural phenomenon 
so my in terms of group activity if i had to put a that's it's difficult to know partly because we know so little about the about the context if we knew more about the context and thought if we thought there's a huge temple here then we could imagine people sort of making a long journey from york or aldborough to come there on the day of a particular festival and that might draw something like a collegium out but it seems to me either it's the action of a very specific group of people who've done something particular in that landscape that they want to mark with making this making this dedication or it's maybe it's a agricultural shrine that people periodically come to at different times of the year they get together collectively because they're the farmers in region x and you know during the festival year maybe you know you know in connection with the agricultural cycle they come there and it's hard to know but i think probably that the specific institutional set of a collegium may be a bit less likely as a scenario that's really interesting thank you john and it reminds us how important archaeological context is for these mm. finds and their interpretation and how there'll often be lots of questions that remain unanswered for metal detected finds where we lack that information um well thank you so much john um it's been a fascinating talk and i think it's been highly enjoyed by our audience and that's been reflected through comments with lots of um thanks are coming through on the comments and lots of very interested and engaged questions so thank you for taking a little bit of extra time and answering them i'm sure our audience will join us um, in a virtual round of applause to say thank you very much um and for those of you who have joined us this evening if you have enjoyed this talk um, you may be interested in the other talks that we have shared as part of this series, all of which ava are available to watch online on York Museum Trust's YouTube channel. So if you just pop um, York Museum Trust and YouTube into a search engine online, you should come across us. And John's very kindly agreed to allow this talk to be available online afterwards. So for those of you who have been asking where this talk will be shared, it will be shared on YouTube. Um, and finally, now that you've heard about the objects themselves, heard about all those fascinating potential um, reasons for their burial, do come and see the Rydale Hoard itself. It's on display at the Yorkshire Museum and our temporary exhibition, which focuses on the hoard and its story, has been extended until the end of the year. So you've got plenty of time to come and see it. Um, you can find out more information on our website and also book tickets there. So thank you once again, John. It's been a pleasure um, and very, very interesting and thought provoking.